session. Uh, the virtual speaker is our very good friend, Cliff Kaufman, whose idea of this whole enterprise was CO25 and Bond of 25. <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, we had a very tough year at CETA because of the loss of our very good friend and a really colleague, Lev Kaufman. So it would be remiss for us not to use this gathering for us to say a few words about Lev, his contribution, and can we organize uh, some of the people the people in this session all had very close associations with Lev, but as you know, throughout this meeting, there have been talks by other people who have had very close associations with Lev. It's just that they have spilled over from the early universe into other areas, some of them being cold, some of them being anisotropic, etc. And so it's uh, just a mark of uh, his breath that he's influenced people in all of these directions. Well, this is not the place to go into Lev's um, CV. I just want to point out that he was highly recognized as a great young man in, uh, in Russia, in spite of the fact that he was at this Estonian Institute, which was not the center of the known universe. The center of the known universe was Moscow as I'm sure some of you might understand. So obviously, one of my great prides was that we were able to entice Lev to see it and kept enticing him to come back. And so he had this great long association with CETA, Canadian citizen, proud Canadian citizen. And he was acting director in his last year and was absolutely great at it. The reason for that is he's such a brilliant uh, people person. Uh, he got well awarded. And just to, for those of you who uh, couldn't join us, Uh, we had a memorial here at CETA. It was really great. Uh, December 9th, 2009. Uh, a bunch of the people who were at CETA uh, said many things, and Sergei, of course, was there. And Anya, his wife, was absolutely fabulous as a speaker and said really profoundly moving things. And, uh, I don't have to say anything about it. It's pretty fabulous. The etymology and the movement. The this 
an event, and so we uh, dedicated that day to Lev. And then shortly after that, uh, Justin Curry, who was the Perimeter Institute, moved to the University of Pennsylvania, and then they started a new particle cosmology institute, and we went down. Lev was supposed to come with me, and uh, there was uh, a, a nice little uh, discussion of Lev at the center. Uh, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, which he was involved with, essentially almost since he uh, came to Canada back uh, around 1990, uh, dedicated a meeting with the Lecture of came along with it, a number of others did. It was uh, wonderful to remember in that context and in that environment, which was a skiing one. Uh, this past weekend, uh, I did the final edits with Physics Today on an obituary, which will appear June 2010. Now, you may know that, or maybe you don't, Physics Today decided not to do any more, or very few obituaries that would actually appear in print, and they would put them online. For Lev, he's one of the exceptional ones that they felt it was appropriate to have something that would appear in the issue, and it'll be June 2010 quite right to, but it's also quite an honor if you see the kind of people that are being selected now for the obituaries. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to read my final lines here. Some of this you will have already recognized, but uh, I'll read it anyway. Let's graduate students remember him as a cosmic soccer player and a gifted real one deftly moving the research ball forward with his team and scoring often. The ball is now passed to us. In his final year, undaunted by the spreading illness, he grew to become an impressively wise active director of CEDA. It is the indomitable fun life loving deeply philosophical spirit of the physics who is very poor, core, and poor end of life and all of its manifestations and even so much. Uh, on uh, May 10th, just about the time that I was finalizing this, I got an email from our good friend, Sal Sasaki. We have had so many adventures together with Lev uh, together. And he asked me if he wanted to use this image uh, to an issue that would be dedicated to Lev for classical and quantum gravity that he and David Lanz are putting together on nonlinear cosmological perturbations. So that indicates, as that Lev's legacy will live on and on and on. And we have made a commitment to finally getting out papers <laughs> with Lev and his co-author. And that is probably the most profound uh, knowing the rate at which papers come out from our uh, camp. But uh, maybe the most profound way we can honor Lev so with Shiji, a paper on our energy we'll be talking about today is about to go out. And uh, Pascal and Shiji and I have made a commitment that we must look at the infamous trajectory paper. I can't even spell it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and Andre, too. We have work to do. And I'd like to say, really, well, we'll do it. Uh, what I thought before we go into the uh, session is that it's worthwhile to hear a little bit because you know before the total concentration, Lev's thesis was on um, uh, gravity and uh, 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 bile tensors and connections to inflation, which obviously continued throughout his life and maybe one might say first love, but he was also quite a player in the large scale structure of the universe and we had great pleasure working on that together and uh, with uh, Dimitri. But preceding that is, of course, uh, Sergei, who goes back much further with Lev. And Varun, but you'd be hearing from Varun. Oh, I had one more thing as part of this. <laughs> Well, I met uh, Lev, I believe it was 
was uh, 1984, later, 1985, I went to talk to observatory where he broke at that time and gave talk on uh, adhesion approximation, because that was a brand new model for us. And he apparently told me that uh, I didn't know him, and you know, there are students and come who don't know all of them. Uh, and after the talk, he came to my room, they had a little guest house where I stayed, and started asking me about logical structure. At that time, I definitely knew uh, a lot more about structure. And uh, he uh, was really enthusiastic, and uh, we talked a lot. Then he came to Moscow, we talked about like construction of his model, and uh, so started working on that. And Timo uh, Pagasian, who was their student at that time, uh, also joined us, and so it was fun collaboration. Uh, we actually, I believe, the model actually is better than it's regarded. <laughs> when I re read it again, we was really poorly written. Our English was such that I just give an example of Lev's English when he came to the United States after being already a couple of years in the United States and in Rwanda. He became member of uh, Institute of Astronomy in Hawaii and he was appointed to be a colloquial uh, you know, uh, czar. And so it was a famous story that after one of the colloquies, at the end, he announced that those who wanted to join the dean of his speaker, expose yourself. Now, that's a great sense of humor, even though <laughs> he didn't intend that. Like <laughs> he liked the story himself. So it was a great fun to work with him and also to enjoy all aspects of life with you know, food, wine, and soccer. I used to play soccer as well. Even here in, uh, in Toronto, and he was very, uh, you know, aggressive player. His size focus was a little bit smaller than mine, but still it was quite hard to, you know, if he was in uh, and opposite team to deal with. Anyway, it was of course a huge tragedy. Uh, his life stopped. And, uh, he was very active. <coughs> uh, and, well, I think that's the best we can do just to remember him. Okay. only place I applied to because my girlfriend was living in Toronto and I was determined I was either going to come to a postdoc in, in CETA or come wash dishes in a restaurant I was moving to Toronto and, and that girlfriend is now my wife so I really truly appreciate uh, <laughs> you 
giving me my, my start here. And um, I, uh, I definitely wanted to begin by, by expressing my appreciation for Lev. He was a, a great teacher, a great colleague, and a great friend. And I, I look at many images of Lev in, in deciding what to put on here, and I came to the same conclusion, apparently, that it did, that this really captured a lot of how I saw him, how I think he saw himself, and how I think he would want us to think of him. Um, I did not realize, when I was coming to this conference, that uh, I was going to be in the Theory Connor Lev Kaufman section, and so the talk I'm giving, actually, I'm, I'm kind of going out on a limb here. I don't know how, how this is going to go over at all. Uh, it's not about the early universe. It's not about cosmology at all. Uh, this is not the work that I was doing with Lev. Anyone who wants to know about the actual cosmology projects I'm working on these days, I'm happy to chat with you about it over dinner and afterwards. But what I'm going to talk about here is a completely different kind of project. And I'm throwing this out. I decided, even though it's a little off topic for the conference, I was going to take a chance to go out on the limb and say, simply because I would love people to go and take a look at this and play with it and, and send us feedback. This is a, a web applet that my student, Stephanie Erickson, and I developed this past year. And I've listened here some of the students who have worked over the past several years on previous versions of it with me. Um, and we call it Curve Land, uh, in homage to Edwin Abbott's wonderful novel, Flatland. Uh, and it is a pedagogical tool for illustrating the concept of non-Euclidean geometry. So I don't have to explain to anyone in this group what I mean by non-Euclidean geometry. I'm just going to briefly say um, what it is that I'm trying to show with this tool and why I think there's a need for a tool like this. And then I'll show you the applet um, and what we do with it. And really, it's designed to explain this idea. A student first encountering general relativity, from the first ideas they have to master is that geometry doesn't have to be Euclidean. What does that mean? So all those rules they learned in high school, we're now telling them, actually, no, that's just a special case. That's not really true in general. Um, angles of a triangle will add up to 180, and so on. And that leads to the obvious question, what on earth does that mean? Um, if I just draw a circle around myself and a diameter, how am I ever going to get an answer other than pi for that ratio? And the standard way that people address that, that you see all the time in every book, in every course, is you draw embedding diagrams. So here's how you can have a triangle that doesn't add up to 180 degrees. You draw it on the surface of a sphere, and look, I have a triangle with three 90 degree angles. And the problem is that any student who's really paying attention, rather than just dutifully writing down whatever you're saying, is going to look at that and say, well, that's not a triangle. It's got three 90 degree angles because you didn't draw straight lines. You drew curves. And you could make those straight lines if you just went inside the sphere. And you say, well, you're not allowed to. We're going to impose this constraint that you only draw on the surface of the sphere. And this is useful as a pedagogical tool, but I think in many cases it leads to a misapprehension that real geometry is Euclidean. And if you draw curved objects in your Euclidean space, that's how you get this violation of non-Euclidean geometry. You get the same thing when you use embedding diagrams to show how gravity works in general relativity. And I won't go into all the details, but there are so many ways in which diagrams like this are useful but incredibly misleading. Um, not the least of which is that you're showing that gravity is really an effect of the curvature of the space-time, and that's why that satellite's going to fall towards the Earth, but you're actually forcing you to imagine gravity in this embedding space that's making the satellite fall down. Um, and that problem is particularly acute when people use embedding diagrams in cosmology. I'm sure everyone in the room has seen, and most of us have probably at one time used, some variation of this image to explain an expanding universe. 
like the surface of a balloon, and so all the galaxies are getting farther from each other, but see there's no center and there's no edge. Only, of course, there is a center. And inevitably, and I've taught courses where I discuss this many, many times, and it's usually the brightest students in the class, um, or the most obnoxious, or both, mm -hmm. who will say, well, but what's inside the sphere? And what's outside the sphere? And it reinforces the notion that the Big Bang happened at a particular place. And I'm already working so hard to explain to students that there's no place in the sky where the Big Bang happened. Embedding diagrams like this don't help. So given all of this, what we set out to do was to come up with an applet that would illustrate what non-Euclidean geometry means without using embedding diagrams. In other words, if you are living in a non-Euclidean space, how can you possibly draw a triangle just drawing three straight lines that connect and find that the angles add up to more than 180 degrees? How can you draw a circle and the diameter and not get fine and so on? And if you think about it, the answer to that is that if you draw these things and then you walk around inside this non-Euclidean space to measure your distances, things appear to distort as you walk. And so what we made is a kind of a kind of mapping software. It's like MapQuest with non-Euclidean geometry. So you are the turtle. And like MapQuest or Google Maps, you're looking at a map, and you always see your current position in the center of that map. And you can use the mouse to put down whatever objects you want in this space. And you can use arrow keys to walk around. Or you can use the arrows on the keyboard, either way. And if this were a Euclidean space, every time you press the key to move one step north, you would just see everything else on the screen slide south, one unit. Since it is a non-Euclidean space, what you actually see is that all of those objects, as you move, are tracing out curved paths. So they're all moving up and down along these trajectories that, from your vantage point, look curved. And you can do all kinds of different things with this. You can, you can just put down dots like that, or you can put down various shapes. Um, what we call an apparent line or an apparent circle means a shape that from your current position looks like a Euclidean line segment or circle. But what you find is if you move somewhere else, they start looking bent and squat. Or you can draw a true line or a true circle, true line meaning a geodesic, a true circle meaning a set of points equidistant from a center. And from your current position, they don't look like a line or a circle, but if you walk over next to that line, as long as you're standing on it, it looks straight. If you move to the center of this circle, you can't always do in perfectly even step sizes, but as you get close to the center of that circle, it starts to look much more circular. Um, you can zoom in or out, holding the curvature of the space constant. And so you can do experiments where if you zoom in very close and you start redoing everything that I just did, which I won't for time reasons, you'll find everything looks just Euclidean. <coughs> everything moves in straight lines as you move. Straight, you know, true, true circles and apparent circles look the same and so on. You can zoom way out, and everything looks really squat. Um, some of you may have figured out by now that the actual space that I'm showing is a two-dimensional space of constant positive curvature with periodic topology, which is to say the surface of a sphere. Um, and so you can also get effects from the topology of the space. For example, if I zoom out to 360 degrees, and I turn on a trail that shows everywhere that I've been, 
I see a circle right to the edge of the screen. That's me. Um, you can also, if I clear out everything here, you can see it more clearly. You can, by default, you zoom out to a maximum of 360. You can enter in any value you want. So now if I zoom out more, I start seeing multiple copies of myself. Um, and with the trail feature on, if I walk around the space, and start seeing my trail distort. And you can do experiments where, for example, I can trace out that triangle I showed you. My step size currently is 10. Those are all measured in degrees around the sphere. Do that a little more carefully, you get a triangle with 390 degree angles. You can put a dot down before you leave on that journey, and when you come back, you'll see that its position relative to you is rotated by 90 degrees. You can do sort of classic measurements of the Riemann tensor. You walk an equal amount in what should be a square, and you come back a little bit turned, and so on. Um, there are many, many other things you can do. Um, and so, as I say, I will conclude just with a request. Anyone who's interested, you don't need to remember that URL. You can just Google me and then get to it from my website also. Um, we're just coming out with this. And anyone who has any thoughts or ideas, we'd love to hear it. I'll stop there. Romanian geometry. Um, rotating disk. So we I haven't I haven't thought specifically about that, but um, I have thought of implementing more complicated geometries. So some of the things that we'd like to do with this, the, the next very simple step would be a constant negative curvature in space, which would be relatively simple to do. Um, ultimately I would like to have an arbitrarily complicated, non-uniform non space, although the algorithm would get much more complicated than that. And what I'd really like to do someday, but I am never personally going to learn the kind of programming that takes to do this, so I have to have just the right student, is get someone who knows how to program 3D graphics, like you know, sort of the first-person shooter games that are so popular now. So you actually could walk through a 3D space and see shapes moving and distorting around you, but I don't know how to program graphics like that. Great. You want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it? Is there a, a, a set of geometries? For the yeah. Right now, there is not. Uh, right now, it's simply 2D constant um, positive curvature. Um, I expect it will not be too long, because it wouldn't be that hard to implement constant negative curvature and let you toggle between the two um, to get anything non-constant. We'd have to do some form of ray tracing to find where objects are and that would be a bit more involved. But I expect we'll do it at some point. Okay. Um, I just want to ask a lady question. Do you find anybody that did not understand, say, that the, um, the circle is not too pi r with the embedding diagram, but did find it that made sense in this thing? Uh, it's, it's an excellent question, and um, the answer is yes and no. Um, I, I have not seen anyone who said, okay, this makes no sense to me, and then suddenly they see this, and the light bulb goes off. Um, I have definitely um, talked to people for whom this made it clear to them they were having trouble with this idea that non-Euclidean geometry could be intrinsic to a space rather than uh, the property of a surface. And, and they tell me that this is helpful to them in visualizing what that means. Expansion. That's a really interesting idea. Um, yeah, I don't see why not. It wouldn't be that hard. 
Okay, maybe we'll move on now. Um, so uh, we had to make, because of, as you know, the schedule is as it is, totally uh, chalk or block, split our brains in two, with if we were more wave function oriented. So uh, we have a, a left student, shared with me, a uh, former left student, but um, I want to point you to a very interesting uh, poster, which was the last thing that I was working on by another uh, student of the left, Jonathan Braden, and uh, Neil Barnaby is working with him on it. So it's there. Check it out. Really interesting. Okay, and this is uh, Shiji, who's going to talk about dark energy. I hope. Okay, easy. Uh -huh. So if 
will take this, uh, it will linear function. Oh, sorry, it's better. So this is W0, this is WA. Uh, then you use, uh, you use all the current observations to measure these two parameters. Uh, CMB, supernova, galaxy, power spectrum, we can see right now the forest. It's uh, all the most current data sets. As a big student, I have always used all the most current data sets. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. I haven't talked about the forecast. So this is the uh, forecast that you will probably see in 10 years or so. So plant it up for the Euclid. I guess, I think, yeah, it's proposed uh, in, for two, 2018, so about 10 years away from, uh, from now. The time is uh, uh, ground, uh, proposed ground-based uh, uh, radio telescope, sitting the radio telescope. It's uh, uh, the kind of Canadian thing. The JDM is the Joint Dark Energy uh, uh, Mission. So in 10 years, we will shrink this contour, the contour of W0, W0, in W0, W0 space by a depth of uh, more than 10. OK, uh, as we said, we don't like we don't like W0 plus W8 transformer, let's say. So this is what we like. Uh, so we have scalar fields. You have a, uh, so either rolling down very fast in the universe, then you can slowly rolling in late universe. Well, you know you need to make a slowly rolling in late universe to make a negative pressure. Uh, no, either it can be uh, staying there for uh, in the universe, not moving at all, because uh, you have huge hubble friction in the universe. Uh, then in late universe, because the uh, uh, dark energy starts to dominate, then you start to roll down. So in this scenario, it's called sawing models. In this scenario, you are rolling very fast in the universe and start to decelerate in the universe. Uh, this model is called tracking. So this kind of forecast model to quintessence. OK, so I'm not going to show the details of the model, because this is like 10 pages long. You will never understand what's going on. So basically, the, the physics is uh, we take three parameters. So uh, if you count omega m and another parameter, it's four parameters. So first f is a very, very complicated function. So uh, that's an analysis code, and uh, you can just code it. Uh, omega m is the current uh, uh, fractional uh, energy density of matter. So alpha t is a parameter that's related to a w at high ratio, uh, small as 1 plus w phi at high ratio. Uh, epsilon s is the slope parameter. It's basically, uh, so when you, so if you have this pressure, uh, so this uh, this maybe is early universe. You are rolling very fast. As uh, so late universe, you have basically you have slope. So this is slope parameter. Uh, we have the slope squared to be uh, an analog for inflationary parameters in early universe. Uh, we also have third parameter which is uh, related to the velocity. So when you are going down, you have velocity, phi dot, d phi dt. Uh, you also have a curvature of the potential. So it's uh, d squared out of v, d phi squared. So using these three parameters, uh, we parameterize w as an initial function of these uh, physical parameters. So for the details of formula, um, and big said we are submitting the table very soon. So, <laughs> so I'm referring to this paper. Okay. Uh, so we have a formula of W. It's uh, based on the parameter, physical parameters from quintessence models. And we use all the uh, most current cosmological data to uh, construct our W parameterization. So what do we learn? Uh, so we have uh, the most important parameter is the slope parameter. Because we don't really care about the high ratio of dark energy uh, that much. Because the high ratio of dark energy is so dominant. Uh, the vision rate is not really that relevant. The most relevant parameter for dark energy for an incandescent model is the slope of the long V. The low ratio. So the slope was determined.
determine how fast you will draw it down and will determine the depth you will have and uh, this will uh, change the observables such, like, such as the uh, uh, luminosity distance or the growth spectrum of the linear structure. So using all the data sets, we measure the omega m and the slope parameter. Uh, the negative part is the phantom models, which Michael doesn't like. Uh, the positive part is the contestants model. So what does the prop say that this math is wrong because negative <laughs> prop is still correct? <laughs> so uh, you can see also CMB is uh, important. Uh, can different data sets, uh, they are complementary. And if you uh, combine all these data sets, you, you, you are concentrating on a very narrow range of x and s, which is saying the slope is really is a very flat potential. You cannot have a potential like this. You are rolling very fast. You are not going to get any uh, late universe acceleration. So this is what uh, you expected. Especially saying that you need to be close to minus one. OK, so you can reconstruct the uh, W trajectories using this uh, our uh, 10 pages long formula. Uh, Using all these data sets, so this is one sigma band of the reconstructed W trajectories. Uh, you can also map this uh, reconstructed W trajectory to the observable space of luminosity distance and put the supernova data on top of it. Okay, so this is uh, for now. We have everything, everything doing fine. And uh, we also need to know how well you can measure all these parameters for contestants models in the next 10 years. Okay, so you do four tasks. CMB where you bank, we cleansing, we are uh, using your grid, which is a European proposed European satellite that's gonna measure about the galaxy, uh, more than a billion galaxies, uh, the relation is about uh, about eight. Uh, we also use uh, JDM Supernova and the BAO. Oh, by the way, uh, BAO, uh, this uh, I already mentioned, this is a Canadian uh, ground based sitting the radio telescope experiment. It's a way more cheaper than all these satellites. So, you want to know which one you should go, right? You want to measure these parameters. Uh, you want to compare these experiments, then you decide which one is good. Okay, so here is the answer. Uh, you want to measure slope of the potential. You want to measure omega m, of course. Okay, so you put out big lens in, put out VAO, put out supernova. Uh, everything is combined with the, the plus 2.5 year prior. And you have been seeing a lot of thoughts like this. Uh, I, will be telling, I will tell you a lot of them are misleading because they use different priors for supernova, VAO, and big lensing. You are always confused what kind of priors they use for each data set. So here, it's very clear. Everything just come back with just plump. No priors on other things, <coughs> just plump. Okay? So we marginalize all the other cosmological parameters, you get this plump. Okay, so what's it, what, uh, what does it tell you? Uh, PAO, remember, it's a ground based experiment. Uh, it's a few million dollars. Uh, this thing, a few million dollars. This thing, uh, again, a billion dollars. So you will see. We should go for this, for just a few million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> we should do BAO, uh, but of course this is a, a conservative estimate, an estimation. For weak lensing, uh, people are working on more complicated things. They will come um, the three point correlations, uh, the Nagoshianity and small scales. Uh, in this plot, I didn't take into account any of these things. So this is, uh, if you ignore all these Nagoshian things, the yeah, the best. If you think about Nagoshianity, I don't have an answer yet. Okay. Uh, so this is our version of a single merit comparing to the previous starting of WA. Uh, so this is the current data. Uh, you, are, you must forget what the alpha t is. Okay, so x or s is a slope parameter. Uh, alpha t is a checking parameter. Uh, so it's uh, basically 1 plus w and time So it's uh, 1 plus w. So 
here, 1 plus w equals to 1 means w equals to 0. So on this side, the same dark energy is behaving like a dark matter. On this side, the same is high value, dark energy is behaving like a, uh, a cosmological constant. So the checking models are motivated to explain the coincidence problem. You want to make high value of dark energy equation of state to be close to be zero, so it can check the, the energy density of dark energy, can check the energy density of a matter. So they are roughly the same order of magnitude. Uh, if you are far away from this thing, you are here, then the coincidence problem is still there. So what this project is telling you, uh, the checking explanation of coincidence problem is not really favored. So if you don't want to go there, you want to be there. Uh, you want high energy, uh, high value of dark energy equation of state to be small, not close to zero. So the checking explanation is a little bit disfavored, but not uh, excluded yet for, uh, by current data. So you can see, if we go for the data in 10 years, okay, all the checking models are almost all there. Right? They are all gone. This was the checking model, not the correct model. Okay. Okay, remember we have a third parameter. Uh, the, basically, it's the curvature of the potential and the velocity when you are drawing, uh, the field velocity when you are drawing here, right? So the, the field velocity plus the curvature determining uh, the third parameter, determining the third parameter, that is z by s. So what does this plot tell you? So this is you're using all the forecast data, uh, the best data we can get in the next 10 years. So this plot, this is the one sigma and two sigma converse. Uh, so this plot is telling you, so this four different fiducial model, uh, given this fiducial model one, fiducial model two, fiducial model three, those three, fiducial model four, then you match, you use the forecast, uh, you produce mock data for the uh, future experiments, then you match it, see. Uh, so if the fiducial model have a zero epsilon s, which is a flat potential at a low relative, you know what to measure this uh, zeta s parameter. Uh, the likelihood would be almost flat. So what does this mean? So uh, if the low relative potential is flat, you are frozen there. You are not drawing because the Hubble, we also have Hubble friction. So you are not drawing, and then you are not going to, first of all, you don't have velocity. Second of all, you don't feel the curvature of the potential. You're not drawing at all, who cares what the curvature is. But if the potential is, the slope of the potential is like large, then you have to draw a down, right? Because there's slope uh, in the lazy universe. Then once you start to draw down, you have velocity, you feel the curvature of the potential. So what, what the problem tells you is uh, uh, you're not going to measure uh, the curvature parameter unless the true model of the universe has a very large slope of the potential. Uh, this is almost disfavored by current data at, at two sigma level. So we are very unlikely to measure these things in the future unless the uh, real model is at uh, two sigma is favored by current data. I mean, this way? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give like stupid more time. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so this is the conclusion. Uh, I will just give it this. Okay, thank you.